Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We have a very special guest today, Liz Collin, author, reporter, Emmy Award winner, so on and so forth. It's there's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to list all of it because we got to get into the meat and potatoes <laughs> here. That's okay. That's boring stuff, Dan. So <laughs> thank you for having me. Sure, of course. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself uh, for the audience's sake, so I don't uh, prattle on about your accomplishments and such. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. Um, but yeah, I'm a Minnesota native uh, from Worthington, Minnesota. That's in the very southwest corner of the state. Kind of a small, small city, small city girl. But um, I grew up with a, a dream of wanting to be a television reporter, as cool as that sounds, right? Uh, but from the time I was five or six, that's what I told everybody I, I wanted to do and sort of ch chase that dream and, and worked in mainstream media for about uh, 20 years in, in, in total. Um, I, I traveled to Florida for college. My first on-air job was, you know, market uh, two fifteen. That's not very. Mm -hmm. That's not very good. Just uh, for anybody listening, uh, <laughs> but you you sort of work work your way up uh, the ladder. So I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, then Wichita, Kansas, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, before landing uh, back home in uh, Minneapolis in two thousand eight, uh, where I worked for fourteen years at WCCO, which is the uh, CBS affiliate. Uh, in Minneapolis. I left mainstream media about a year ago, uh, put out this book uh, due to sort of some personal and professional things happening. And uh, I'm in independent media now uh, with an organization called Alpha News. Mm. So um, I, I guess you, you've been around for a very long time. Can you talk to how, because um, I'm not familiar with this, from the local to national news level, kind of how things from a reporter or journalist perspective have changed over the last couple of decades. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And this is, you know, just just my experience in my perspective. But I know uh, many people kind of are, are feeling this way. But I think it was probably five or six years ago, I really noticed a, a very, a very noticeable shift um, with with the media. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that you can point to to ratings and such to, to see this as well. But um, there were there were a lot of different narratives that I just I was not comfortable pushing, um, not even as a, a person, but but as a journalist. A lot of this had to do with uh, police issues. Issues, um, a, really a palpable hatred of then presidential candidate uh, Donald Trump, who you know obviously eventually became president. And we saw that hatred continue uh, by the media, and um, also different different narratives with with COVID, which is uh, around the time that I that I left uh, the mainstream. It, again, it wasn't so much um, on, on these topics that um, the things that we were reporting, uh, but I was privy to a lot of information we were not. And I think that, you know, as what journalists are supposed to do is inform the public and tell the truth, uh, help people, you know, make make critical de decisions. And I just felt we weren't we weren't really doing that anymore. Um, yeah, I think I've heard this a lot from people in your position. And I'm curious if you can, I, obviously, I don't want you to necessarily out anybody, but can you can kind of describe how a conversation would have gone between uh, your bosses, maybe, and you, where they're trying to get you to push a certain narrative or maybe back off of one or maybe, you know, send some information, but not everything? How, how does that what, what does that conversation go like? Is it is it more tongue in cheek? Like, oh, I think maybe we should do this or is it very direct? Yeah, and I think um, I think Dan just just backing up. It wasn't mm -hmm. so obvious, um, you know, b before. But you just saw the landscape changing as as social media really really came on board and people getting their news online. So all of a sudden, you're forced to kind of compete in that s space, uh, you know, with catchy headlines, with you know, 20 seconds of video. A lot of a lot of things where people aren't taking the the time to really put things in proper context, um, or spending a lot of time, uh, you know, on an investigation or a long term story that just wasn't wasn't happening anymore. Um, so, you know, tip, typical newsrooms, you know, start their day with a with a morning meeting and, you know, there's an after afternoon editorial meeting uh, as well. Uh, and you just sort of notice um, in these newsrooms, these reporters are getting younger and younger. You know, Minneapolis, for example, would never really hire uh, people right out of college. You'd had to be a reporter and sort of work your way up for five, six years before you were even really considered, um, you know, in a, in a market that size. Well, that's not the case anymore. Um, and I would say that there's a lot more left leaning kids who graduate from college uh, until they, you know, see, see the world a, a, a bit. Um, so some of some of that was was trickling over uh, just just, you know, in that 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 has uh, played a role in, you know, salaries kind of plunging in, in 
the newsrooms and, and and such. So they they can't afford you know people who've been around for a little while. Uh, just 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 things like that. So uh, CBS, I, I will say, um, and I talk about this actually in my book. Um, you know, being a more left leaning. Uh, company, but a lot of the purse strings are, are, are tied to, to New York and, and different mandates that were put in place uh, by CBS News um, that I do talk about in uh, their lying. One being, um, you know, that after this George Floyd incident, which I know we'll, we'll get into, but um, that the 50 percent of the people we have to interview on the news have to be non-white or from a protected class. Um, and this mandate happens shortly after um, George Floyd dies in, in police custody. But again, the, these are things that are happening uh, with, with how we're crafting the message and, and pushing propaganda rather than, uh, you know, really asking the questions that I felt needed to be asked um, and, and and just different uh, stories that I, I felt should have been reported all along. Sure. Yeah. And how do you uh, di- this is, I guess, more of a, a procedural question, but how do you how did you or would you personally balance you know, the, the, I, I guess sharing all the information that you have with the public, um, versus then providing narrative and context to that, because there's a, there are obvious pitfalls, editorializing, editorializing and things like that. Um, when it comes to narrative and context, but how do you handle something like that? How do you decide how to contextualize something? You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, uh, approaching every uh, story over the years, I really went in with, uh, you know, an open mind and I believed in, you know, both sides. I think a lot of people, you, you know, would say that there's many sides to a story. We always kind of focus on two, but <laughs> in fact, there are there are many more, um, you know, that you can gather as a, as a reporter. Um, uh, but again, I, you know, I, I just sort of would, would take to that approach with every story, sort of writing questions that I knew needed to be answered be answered you know before uh conducting interviews and but now we see a lot of just press release reporting uh you know i i think that's pretty easy to see where there's a press release with a press conference and you know you just have a media that kind of parrots um a lot of uh what uh, officials, and that especially happens uh, here in the Minneapolis area, what these officials say, and nobody's really questioning them or, or holding them accountable. That sort of went away, I feel like, uh, in reporting. But again, you also have to have a really good grasp of, of some of these uh, subjects and, and know the backstories, but there's not necessarily that, that curiosity, I feel like, that that used to be there uh, to really fully understand the, you know, the full picture. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it seems a lot like um all of these institutions have uh, degraded over time. People used to get into teaching because they liked uh, uh, being around kids or they enjoyed, you know, being professorial or whatever. They realized that they weren't going to get wealthy doing it. Um, same thing with policing. They just it, it was a very masculine drive to protect the people around you and your community and things like that. And then journalism. I don't think most people got into journalism in the in the middle part of the 20th century with the expectation that they were going to write a book and become wealthy. I think it was, you know, people that were just curious. Right. And now it seems like um, everybody is getting into everything to try to maximize profit for themselves. And I am not sure that that's well, I I am sure that that's bad, you know, uh, but it it seems like an inescapable thing in our in our culture right now. And, and, And regardless of what industry you're in, everybody's always looking to the next thing and trying to angle for the next thing. Well, I think that's a that's a great point um, and, and something that I, you know, completely saw in, in this profession. And I think social media has helped that as well. There is this me, me, me uh, generation that social media has helped to to create, uh, you know. I'm old enough that we didn't we didn't have Facebook when I started as a reporter or Instagram, uh, and it wasn't a picture of what I was wearing every day or this is how a story affects me. Uh, that that wasn't happening. I, I cared and still to this day care more about the the person I'm doing the the story about, not necessarily how I feel about it. Um, you know that that wasn't encouraged, but I think social media has helped uh, has helped to to do that. Um, and and you know there there is this. Um, thought by newsrooms that that helps, uh, you know, people connect with you as a as a person so that that is encouraged. But what's getting lost there is, I think, um, you know, some of these really critical stories and, and really giving a voice to the voiceless. Right. Which is sort of this, this pledge um, that I that I feel like uh, journalists uh, have, have signed up for. But I think that is uh, b- being lost a bit. Sure. And it doesn't help. Uh, I don't think that. Most of media has been. Uh, has become a conglomerate at this point, right? I mean, I think five companies own 80% of the newspapers in the country, something like that. Um, it's, it, 
and maybe that's just the natural progression of, of any business, but, um, it's good to see that there's so much independent journalism going on now. Um, like people like you, uh, I, I like alpha news. Uh, the free press is good. I like, uh, Laura Logan's a good friend of mine. She does that as well. And it's, I think it's good, but it's, it's still hard to penetrate the market, right. With, uh, the broader market, we don't have three television stations and, and four print, you know, newspapers anymore. There's a lot of competition for, for, for stuff. And it seems like, um, we're getting dumber, you know? So <laughs> how do you balance speaking to people who are willing to just click, uh, retweet on some stupid bullshit they haven't even looked into rather than actually looking into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously as a journalist and, and as a conscious human being that wants your country to be better, you've got to put some effort into trying to capture those people attention as well. But it is, I, I see more and more that particularly on the conservative side, just it, it's just memes and headline fodder bullshit. Honestly, I don't see a whole lot of substance, substantive journalism going on anymore. Yeah, no, I think uh, you bring up a, a great point. And I will say that, uh, you know, I made this leap over in independent media because I do feel that this is this is the future uh, of things. And, and the numbers really do reflect that. I mean, people aren't watching the news like they, they used to. Um, and I and I saw that in, in my time as well. And you also have the, these companies, right? It's the same story in the same order. They say the same thing about every single night. And, you know, it's 15 seconds here, 30 seconds there. And, you know, again, not really going... Uh, taking a, a deep dive or really um, you know giving much context I think to people same with the newspapers same front pages uh, you know etc et so um, you know we we play the game with um, you know we've we've been censored a few times on YouTube and, and such you know if things are things are a little racy but play the game on uh, you know social media and we we've had actually just an overwhelming response uh, at alpha we've only been around um, for about six years now so it is fa fairly new um, but we have you know hundreds of thousands of people looking at our stuff um, every day and we have a, a, a big mailing list uh, for people to get our online uh, free newsletter it's just alphanews.org and we really just focus on you know three four stories a day that we know that the mainstream media I is not going to cover because it's pretty predictable uh, what, what they are going to cover and wh where they're not uh, going to look and I, and I always tell people that I think you do have to, you know, read, uh, you know, and look at a variety of, of news sources. Um, I, I think it's pretty funny how um, Elon Musk now has tagged uh, NPR. I don't know if you saw that with uh, state sponsored media. And I think people are people are starting to to wake up to the fact that um, you know there's a reason the, these companies are, are pushing this messaging. I, I think it's like 70, 80 percent of ad revenue is paid for by big pharma when it comes mm -hmm. to um, mainstream media stations. That's why you're not going to see a you know a vax side effect story on the <laughs> evening news or you know something the CDC finally acknowledges now uh, a couple of years later. But you had independent media really breaking a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, you're called a conspiracy theorist and you're you're crazy, right? But then, you know, six months, a year later, you have everybody else <laughs> report, reporting the same thing. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, and to the point of uh, that you made before, it, so the response, th this is a good example of what you were talking about. When a leftist person, uh, particularly a politician or somebody that's in charge of something somewhere, whether it's a company or otherwise or, or a union or whatever, whenever they get COVID, it's they, they post the exact same paragraph. It's literally word for word. Like, I'm glad that I'm, uh, thankfully I'm, I'm, I'm vaccinated and boosted or whatever the fuck they say. Who, who is writing this script? And, and, and what is the expectation, I guess? It, seem, it feels very 1984 to me. When people are that blatantly dishonest in a way that everyone can just go, you can, you can figure out what's happening relatively easily, right? These, there's, there's plenty of uh, independent information now where you can tell what's going on. Yet they still do this. They still parrot the same line. Um, to me, that reads very 1984, where it's like two plus two equals five, and you're going to believe us or else. And yeah, you've probably seen Dan the yeah the clips um, that that share you know a news story, oh, yeah. and everybody's you know reading the same thing, and that you know comes from the Associated Press wire, where people, a lot of producers don't even bother to rewrite those stories, obviously. Um, anymore, but but I do think you know, and that's why I think the the future is independent media holding uh, holding uh, you know the the spotlight on this and holding people accountable by by just uh, calling it out. I think you know I, 
being a being a midwesterner and you know minnesota kid i I think there is some common sense uh left but there's also we know a great fear in in speaking out and having the courage uh you know to come forward and call some of this stuff for you know as bs as it clearly is um you know and i and i saw that uh obviously um up close with with my own uh, profession and my own personal life yeah and it's uh you know from the from the larger media perspective there's a lot of this um, obviously there's a lot of censorship going on, but there's a lot of weird stuff going on too. So, uh, Trump gave an announce or gave a press conference. I think it was, uh, I think it was Tuesday evening from his residence or something. And he had his podium with his, uh, Trump 24 and then his text, whatever to whatever number it was. And ABC actually blurred that out. Right. When they were, when they were, um, uh, when they released the footage, some of this stuff seems pretty obviously to be election interference, right? Like, I'm not sure h- how you could do that because uh, I know there are, there are rules. I'm not too familiar with them, but I know there are rules in the media about um, equal access to broadcast time and, and things like that. It's one of the reasons that Trump had to leave whatever that weird reality show he was on before. But that seems that that's very overt, right? People used to be kind of, um, you know, you you know but you don't know and now they just don't give a shit they just do it right out well i think yeah i I think absolutely right there used to be (laughs) that you know they would maybe try to to balance a story or uh, attempt to but i but i agree with you i think that the you know that that has gone away they don't even um try to you know cater i guess to that other side but then they spend all this money on you know research and and different things of what they're going to try different or what are they hearing from from people and it's you know as i said kind of the same story that the the same messaging and and i'm kind of just speaking from my experience um at a a cbs station but i know that you know i've heard from enough uh people that uh you know kind of having a similar story at, at, at stations uh across the country yeah, it's interesting because that's this is it's kind of the same way that we um, that we write academic papers, right? So if there's an issue or contention or doubts about your premise or about your research or whatever it is that you're doing, typically before the conclusion part of your your research paper, you will lay those out and address them directly, right? That's kind of how it's done. So if I'm writing about physics, like so a lot of like we don't have a test for this yet, but the math makes sense. Here's what some people say about it. Here's our response to that. And then you get into your conclusion. That's a typical uh, uh, way to write a research paper and typically how people have done journalism. Right. Um, It's very bizarre to me now that it's I I don't know that there's real news anymore. Um, It's it's almost like uh, and, and I don't I look, you can you can view it as a good or bad thing. Um, there's certainly always been propaganda, but I think the fact that there is so much so much noise and, and very little signal these days, my hope is that people will uh, learn how to sift through bullshit, right? I mean, I think that's a useful skill to have. And we're kind of up against the wall right now when it when it comes to that stuff, because it's just a constant flood of nonsense. Yeah, I, sift through bullshit. I like this as a... Maybe this is the title of a book. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that you can easily see, you know, how um, leaders, politicians can manipulate the message so easily. Um, just just talking about, um, you know, my own experience in Minneapolis, um, kind of the reason I, I put this book out um, with this uh, George Floyd situation. Uh, my, my husband at the time, um, still my husband, but at the time he was the uh, president of the uh, the police union uh, for for, um, Minneapolis uh, police officers. So representing about 900 officers uh, that that were there at the time. And, uh, you know, I I saw sort of for myself how, you know, the mayor, the, you know, the governor, um, the police chief of the department, um, you know, they were lying from the beginning, which is why uh, my book is called They're Lying, uh, The Media, The Left and the Death of of George Floyd. But but really what troubled me most uh, were there was no pushback, uh, you know, from the the, uh, the media at all here locally. They just went along with all of this sort of follow falling in in lockstep using the hashtag uh, Black Lives Matter in a lot of their uh, reporting. This was sort of ground zero for that movement and where, you know, the match was struck uh, here in Minneapolis and and spread across the world in in some cases, Uh, you know, but they lied about that case from the beginning. You know, journalists knew better, uh, but they weren't going to go ahead and and put any of that in in print or or on television, um, you know, because of 
you know, be, being subject to cancel culture, which I was uh, through through all of this. And, you know, collateral damage happened to be uh, policing in America, I feel like, uh, as we know it. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. Um, so, again, the title of the book is They're Lying, the Media, the Left, and the Death of George Floyd. Um, take me through what it is exactly they're lying about and how. Well, I'm, I'm, I hope we have a lot of time here. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's, a good it's good that we have a long show. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I kind of wanted to, uh, as with anything, I, I keep a lot of notes when it comes to uh, news stories because I tend to follow things for, for years. Um, and I, I was seeing this play out, uh, you know, again, on a personal and professional level, but I was so troubled um, by it more so a, as a journalist. So I'm just keeping notes through all of this, um, you know, wh what's happening in my own newsroom, um, et cetera. And um, I wanted to take readers in the book through kind of the very beginning, minute by minute, to, to where we are today. I end the book um, with a, something called the right side of history question mark. You know, we were told that we were going to be living on the on the right side of history after all of this. Uh, we were told that again and again. But I don't know if we can really look at what's happened um, since with skyrocketing crime. Uh, you know, just a, a crisis when it comes to uh, policing uh, recruitment and retention. I don't really think many of us think this is, uh, you know, the right side of, of history. But but just to, just to start with with this incident itself, um, you have within hours um, the, the police chief call in the FBI after reviewing the Facebook, the viral Facebook video um, of this incident um, that to this day, most people, um, of course, have seen, but they haven't seen um, the four body cameras um, that, that were readily available um, to the public, all four officers. And I say four because there was a, a, also another reason that they, they stuck with this Facebook narrative of, a, you know, making it black and white. It's a black man uh, with a white officer uh, on top of him. But nobody talks about the black officer um, that was with George Floyd twice as long um, as Derek Chauvin was. Um, you also have a Hmong American, another uh, Tutau, who responded to the scene um, also, I say this was the United Nations of uh, poli police calls as far as this is concerned. But they deliberately hid the video uh, because there is so much on that video that goes against um, y what the they started um, talking about within hours um, of this incident. You have the mayor of Minneapolis apologizing to black America in tears uh, within hours. Again, you have the chief um, calling the FBI. You also have them saying, uh, Dan, uh, from the start that this is not a part of training. They've never seen this maneuver before. You know, that Derek Chauvin's knee is on the neck of a black man. Uh, this is also a lie. Uh, they went ahead and they took down uh, two pages of their training manual. Mysteriously, those uh, disappear the very next day that talks about this MRT, this maximum restraint technique, which you can clearly hear on the officer's body cameras uh, that they're talking about doing um, and doing this maneuver. And also Derek Chauvin's knee being on um, George Floyd's shoulder blade and, and not his neck. But all of a sudden the narrative goes to these uh, chokeholds and we're banning this and we're banning that because again, they lied uh, from the start. <sighs> Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. That that second angle, of, I, and that, I just barely scratched the surface. Oh, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that that second angle um, of body cam footage was particularly damning for that whole narrative. As was the toxicology report. Obviously, had I think eleven times the lethal dose of fentanyl in the system, which you know, uh, I, I guess congratulations. I don't know what the fuck to say about that. That's a, a, a he broke a world record, maybe. I don't know, but um, yeah, that was all very bizarre, and it's. Um, I, I think so. You know who James Lindsay is? Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's got this theory that um, that it was. I, I guess people refer to it as a psyop, and the same thing with COVID too. It's like I don't I don't necessarily think that some international cabal decided to release a pestilence on the world to garner more control, but they were certainly waiting around for one to happen so they could garner more control, right? I mean, that, I think that much is. Uh, indisputable. So in the same way, he, he believed that the Floyd thing was just a particularly convenient way to get people back at each other's throats and divide the country. And now his premise is that they're looking for the next, they're looking for a trans person to get murdered or suicide, something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, his current premise or his current, um, idea is that <clears throat> this, uh, Dylan, whatever the fuck his name is, is uh, being kind of propped up and made famous so that 
people will lash out against him. And, uh, uh, and by the way, it's him because women don't get five o'clock shadows to my understanding. But, um, yeah, so people will lash out against him and either somebody will attack him or he'll kill himself or something like that. And then it's like, Oh, woe is me. And I'm not sure if they're even going to wait that long. I mean, a, a, a fucking trans person, which I don't think is even a real thing, but this alleged trans person is, um, uh, uh, shoots up a school and then we, we, we spend the next week celebrating trans people. It reminds me a lot of the people that were really pushing in the early part of two, uh, September, 2001 to build a mosque at the ground zero site. Do you remember that? That was really bizarre. It's like, look, man, <clears throat> there's 2 billion Muslims in the world. If they all wanted to destroy the entire earth, I think they could probably figure it out. I mean, it's 2 billion is a lot of people. So if they really wanted, if every Muslim was a terrorist, we would probably know about that. Um, but it's just like a thumb in the eye. It's, it's unnecessarily instigating shit. You know what I mean? And it seemed, there seems to be some purpose behind that. Yeah, I think um, you, you bring up some great points here. And I always say, especially with this incident, uh, Dan, you had the perfect people in the perfect places and, you know, positions uh, for this to play out in, in Minnesota. We are we are people that are, you know, like, OK, is somebody else going to stand up or is somebody else going to tell the truth about this? Oh, Whereas, you know, maybe more on the, up there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I feel like if this was, you know, East, West Coast, you know, Florida, there would have been somebody to. And, and my husband is kind of that that character. He was, uh, you know on stage with president trump so of course this is his fault um but you have this uh, pr campaign that basically concocted this messaging after the riots are so mishandled to place the the blame on on bob um and the union i know you talked about um the medical examiner's report a bit but just going back to that it's interesting that uh, george floyd's autopsy was conducted within 12 hours uh, but that is also withheld from the public for an entire week so in the book um, I have documentation sort of back and forth between the medical examiner, the Hennepin County medical examiner and prosecutors at the time, kind of having him change his story a bit um, to play down the, the, you know, the three and a half times uh, of the lethal limit of fentanyl uh, that George Floyd had um, in his in his system. And you also had the media that basically went along with that narrative, too. I've been I've been doing stories about uh, drug overdoses for years um, and especially with, you know, the the onset of, of fentanyl and such in the community. And this story, you didn't even mention you didn't even mention that at all, uh, because, of course, um, that didn't play a part. And you also have, of course, the, you know, the arrest of George Floyd that happens a year before this uh, in 2019, almost exactly a year where he exhibits almost the exact uh, same behavior um, in that traffic stop. But again, the next day um, after this incident on May 25th, 2020, you have the the police department, the, the, you know, the, the mayor saying they've never heard of George Floyd before, um, never heard of him you know, no history or anything. Again, another another lie. He's the the subject of an undercover drug investigation that went on for months uh, in 2019, and he was very well known uh, to the department. So, <clears throat> you th certainly there were the right people in places of authority and in the media to turn this story into something that it clearly wasn't. Uh, towards what end? Um, I, I just assume anybody trying to divide me is trying to conquer me because that phrase is about 5,000 years old and it's been very applicable for throughout all of history. But um, the, the character George Floyd himself is not a particularly convenient or, 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 or I guess, um, likable character, a guy that's held a pregnant woman at gunpoint, a, a guy that's been in and out of prison, a guy that's a crackhead. You know what I mean? I, I, I guess you don't get to choose, but it seems like uh, Philando Castile would have been a better opportunity to do something like that. You know what I mean? Because that 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 whole situation, I think, was kind of fucked up. And sometimes, look, I've been in quite a few gunfights in my life overseas, and sometimes shit just doesn't. When when, when it's a tense situation and and guns are involved or or it's whatever, sometimes stuff just doesn't go the way you want it to. You know what I mean? It, it sucks. It's like I don't know you, you don't know me. We're suspicious. People get jumpy bad things happen. Uh, but that situation seemed like one that we could talk about how to better handle these kind of situations. And it, and it also seemed like something that was more in line with the narrative, which is that black people feel differently towards the police and whether it's true or not in every place, they feel like police feel quite a bit differently about them. That would have been an interesting and probably productive conversation, but it all got vacuumed out of the room by a literal crackhead. 
Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I, I, have you seen by chance, uh, Candace Owens, her greatest lie ever sold, uh, that documentary by daily wire by uh, chance? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'll just uh, talk about, talk about that for a second if I, if I can, because her sure. team did a, did a great job and they really followed the money, uh, when it came to, to black lives matter. And that, that was sort of my, um, point. There was so much of this documentation early on of the outside forces that were coming into to Minneapolis um, to you know to wreak havoc on, on all of this but but you're right there are certainly conversations uh, to have about a lot of these um, incidents and, and such but I, but I felt like if they would have just been honest about this and walked frame through frame you know with the video instead of you know basically igniting uh, you know this race war if you will over this uh, police incident um, that you know part of Minneapolis didn't have to burn to the ground a lot of other cities uh, lost a lot of businesses and you know again they're paying the consequences uh, daily with this uh, defund the police movement mm. that that cropped up uh, here here in Minneapolis, but it really is um, uh, astounding to me how they they just sort of let that um, let that run wild. But in in this uh, documentary that Candace and her team did, they come back to Minneapolis and they talk to uh, George Floyd's roommates. So these are people he'd been living with uh, for about five years, and they're in a, a suburb um, called St. Louis Park here mm. in in Minnesota, just outside Minneapolis. And so they um, they talk about how um, they haven't seen George Floyd's family at all. He never, he never came back. They never came back to collect his personal belongings. His, his car is still in the driveway. Um, they have no idea, you know, they, he, they don't even want his, his, his stuff. Um, so I thought that was pretty uh, eye opening. And Candace goes ahead and she pays to have George Floyd's uh, car towed out of the driveway and pays back rent uh, to these people out of her own pocket and such. But, um, you know, they, they have some amazing findings when it comes to this, uh, you know, cash grab uh that blm did in the wake of all of this and no mainstream media reported on any of any of this at all just completely just completely ignored yeah it's uh you know what's really interesting to me right now um is how so many i used to live in oakland how so many bay area uh and silicon valley people are now pining for more police and asking for the resignations of uh politicians now that it's their friends getting stabbed and look uh i i'm not trying i don't want to use the cash up guys uh, death for any kind of political purpose. I think that's uh, kind of gross, to be honest. But it is interesting to see, uh, and th that maybe this is just how it happens when things come close to home and become personal for you. You actually start to care about them. It's it's um, a lot of people have this not in my backyard mentality, and then once it comes into your yard, then they become activists. We see it every almost every Democratic uh, presidency where the first couple of years of their presidency, the borders are very open. And then they start really enforcing border control after that. I think Obama uh, <clears throat> ended up deporting more people than every president before him combined over the course of his last four years in office. Um, but it, to your other point about, about how fake it all is, it seems like there's an institution inside government and inside the infrastructure of social justice, as it were, that hops from one minority plight to another so they can capitalize on it financially. You know what I mean? And I'm not sure if it's like in, in, in American politics and then broadly, more broadly speaking, in politics in the West, there's a kind of a wink and a nod system, a good old boy system. I don't know that people are sitting in dark rooms, uh, twisting their mustaches, saying, hey, you know what we got to do is limit people's rights. I think they just feel that way. And they're like, hey, we're going to do this. And everybody kind of is in on it. You know what I mean? For uh, uh, within the uh, political class or aristocracy. And I wonder if it isn't the same for this. People just see it as uh, a, a relatively easy and effective opportunistic ability to make money off of people. Yeah, I think that's uh, that can't be under understated. You know, it's sort of like they have this follow the science. You know, we heard about it again and again, but it's really follow the money. That's mm. uh, <laughs> that, that that's where you, you you need to go. And you know, it's money, money and power. And we definitely saw that uh, pl play out here. Uh, but you also have a media that is supposed to be, you know, the the checks and balances and and hold uh, you know people accountable or question them at least uh, when it comes to to this. And and that didn't happen. You know, so uh, just just going back. Um, I had about four protests, I think, uh, in, in total um, at our house um, that that summer, because, again, this is, you know, all, all my husband's fault. Uh, one was a, a Black Lives Matter sponsored. Well, two were a Black Lives Matter sponsored protests. But there were two girls um, who came holding a sign 
And they candidly admitted they're from Oregon. And I mm-hmm. just thought this is, you know, fascinating. They were there for the weekend. I thought this would be a great, uh, great story. They have no idea who I am. They don't care who Bob is. This is just, you know, they're put up at a hotel and they're in, in town for the weekend. Um, <laughs> but, but yet, you know, the, the, these these paid protesters um, and Candace does a good job in, in her documentary, to, you know, going after um, some of these groups that are training protesters uh, to do to do that as well. We also uh, know quite a few um, security officers at uh, MSP at the Minneapolis uh, St. Paul Airport. And they talked about, um, you know, seeing that that first day. Um, you know, as as planes are arriving um, to to Minneapolis and uh, people from you know Washington, um, you know other states uh, arriving uh, to protest. Actually, in fact, there was um, somebody who sent a a bomb threat uh, to our house uh, that summer in the mail, and uh, the 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 Washington County Sheriff's Department they were able to fingerprint. Um, I was sort of reporting all of this because, you know, I don't really think anything's going to happen, but you got to, you know, just just to be uh, just to be on the safe side. But they fingerprint this letter, Dan, and they trace uh, this guy. He was living in Minneapolis at the time, but he was arrested for a protest um, out uh, on the West Coast a couple of years before for throwing a bottle at a police officer during during that protest. So, again, you see all of this in, in full force. Um, you know, uh, but you have the media basically taking that and, and peddling racial injustice and, mm. and these different narratives um, to sort of feed the beast, uh, if you will, but not really looking at it with a, a critical eye uh, for what it was. Yeah, I, I think it's really difficult to tell. I mean, w- the over the past couple of years, it's hard not to become uh, very conspiratorial, I guess, uh, because it's just, we're just because you're right. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> correct. I mean, it, we're, it's it's we're just being lied to in such volume and in such an obvious way that's of they're falsifiable claims right that that you can re- relatively easily falsify um i can't tell if it's just like an accidental avalanche or if there's somebody up there blowing up dynamite you know to to dump all this stuff on it's it's hard to tell if it's coordinated or not but i to your point about the protesters you said they were put up at a hotel by whom Right. Well, um, interesting. Um, we would um, talk about how, and this documentation was very, it was very uh, readily available early on, the the ties to George Soros. Mm. Um, he had many, um, many different, uh, you know, I don't know, nonprofits, if you will, but uh, these different companies that were cropping up. And we would talk about this, um, you know, Bob and, and myself in, in different media interviews. I was I was not involved at all at, at that time. I am now uh, more so with that because I lost my voice, which is funny being a, a member of the media. Right. Uh, and because I was focused on the truth and they wanted me to shut up. So. Um, So Bob is talking about this in interviews and, you know, he's painted, of course, as, uh, you know, being a Nazi. And that's, you know, anytime you drop George Soros. But, you know, the newspaper comes out with this story about a year later, clearly showing that George Soros helped to to funnel money uh, to the defund the police movement in in Minneapolis, uh, front page of the paper. And, and, you know, a lot of money uh, that that came in here to support um, city council members for pushing that messaging. Um, et cetera. So it's it's been well documented at this point. Uh, his, his tentacles in this movement, and also uh, we just had a, a you know race for governor. Um, ob- obviously here in in uh, 20, 2022 also, and George Soros money was you know top one of the top donors to the DFL, uh, the Democratic Party here in in, in Minnesota. So um, he he's uh, he and his associates are, are playing uh, a lot of work and there are ties to the um, attorney general's office as well, who played, um, you know, a critical role in the prosecution of all these police officers. In addition to these four officers who are now in prison, uh, there is another um, former police officer, uh, Kim Potter, mm. uh, involved in the Dante Wright uh, situation, the mistake that she made, uh, who is in, in prison currently as well. And that is uh, due to this uh, attorney general, Keith Ellison. Yeah, I ran into Keith uh, multiple times. I, I, wor- oh. I worked in some politics in the uh, in the Wisconsin and Minnesota area back in the day. Just uh, not that I was particularly interested in working in politics, but mostly because I just wanted to witness it from a firsthand perspective and see uh, how fucked up these people were. And they're the most fucked up people <laughs> in the world, frankly. Um, and yeah, to to the to the point, you I mean, heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I don't think anybody's shocked by all that. Uh, um, yeah, my friends with the Atlanta Police Department showed me the arrest details of all those morons from a few weeks ago that were, you know, rioting around one of their training facilities 
and 85 percent of the people are from other places and i don't mean mm -hmm. from and live in atlanta or live in in fulton county or that stuff they're literally residents of other states from very far away and they don't appear like the kind of people who could afford cross-country travel in expensive hotels <laughs> you know what i mean uh they're fucking losers right uh, uh so it is very bizarre uh you, you would think at what point does does someone investigate i mean i know the fbi is not going to do it because they're corrupt as shit but this is this is a pretty solid rico case in my opinion right this is what this that this is what the rico statutes and predicates were were created for is to uh, determine uh, or to identify and prosecute an ongoing criminal enterprise and frankly uh the same group of people both funding uh this this bullshit and then it resulting in two billion dollars worth of damage and 28 or so people murdered that seems like a pretty good case. Like if this was an organization with an Italian last name, we would have been prosecuting it right away. Well, Dan, you would think so. Yeah, there there are so many so many questions uh, I still have uh, to to this day. Very few people, um, you know, even serving uh, prison time, uh, you know, for for what happened with the burning a police precinct, uh, you know, robbing uh, many businesses, et cetera. But, you know, just the fallout since we had 1200, I believe the number is businesses just in the last calendar year that have left Minneapolis. You have a police department, uh, you know, that went from nearly 900 uh, officers uh, below 500 at, at this point. And that uh, number is is likely lower with people leaving basically uh, daily. You you've implemented now this uh, no consequences uh, for actions. Uh, they're they're not going after you know anybody for anything. Juveniles are are just free to run around and and steal cars. Just it, just in one day alone. Um, there were, I think, 35 cars stolen in Minneapolis. There would not even be that within a year. And this is happening uh, within within one day. Uh, so, again, I don't really think this is uh, the right side of history uh, we are, are living on. And, and this is how I approach this, um, even even the book, Dan. I, I wanted to approach it as a reporter. I mean, I, I didn't even really consider myself a political person, to, to be quite honest. But a lot of this, I, I feel like, is is fighting evil. Mm. Um, you know, th that's sort of what we're what we're up against here. And, you know, lying uh, to me is <laughs> a, a cr criminal, I, I believe. Uh, you know, and we saw we saw so many lies when it when it came t t to this. But I, I think there are, you know, a, a few players here that are directly responsible um, for, for all that ha all that has happened and, and all that continues uh, to happen here uh, in the metro area. Well, I mean, if you're having three dozen cars stolen in one night, you may want to look at Nick Cage because uh, he kind of has a history of that. If that's a gone in 60 seconds reference. I, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm a woman, you know, you guys speak in, in movie uh, slang. So oh, that's, yeah, that's it's, different. it's either that or football, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. It's, this is all yes, really exactly. bizarre. Uh, and, and the only way that anybody gets away with it is because the media is complicit, not just turning a blind eye, but they're literally complicit. I mean, uh, the, the, we, we see examples, you, you can, you can pick one out of any week, um, <clears throat> with, uh, recently trying to defend Alvin Bragg as not like, oh, he's, yeah, he took a million dollars from Soros for his campaign, but he doesn't, he hasn't met the guy like, okay, what the fuck are you, what does that have to do with anything? If he's met him or not, yeah you know what I mean? Like if somebody calls me on the phone and pays me to murder somebody, I'm still guilty of the murder and they're still guilty of paying me for it. Um, and then to, uh, on the Floyd case. I'm sure everybody remembers this, but during the case or during during the trial, Chauvin trial, um, there are people outside rioting, yelling with bullhorns and throwing shit into the federal courthouse or into the federal building, uh, intimidating jurors. And, and some of the jurors even said as much after the, the trial was over that they were intimidated and didn't want to give the wrong verdict. Um, I don't understand how like it seems like if we were in a legitimate criminal justice system, that would have been a mistrial and we would have had another trial in a different venue somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah, I think uh, you know, that's a great point. And I and this is what I say, you know, I've kind of been doing these these book talks. Um, but even if you aren't connected to policing, um, you know, there is so much to be learned from this, because if you care about justice um, in, in America, which we all should as uh, citizens of this country, you should care about this uh, case. So you currently have um, Derek Chauvin, who's who's serving, you know, a 21 year sentence now. Um, he's at an Arizona facility. Uh, he's been moved um, fr from Minnesota, but he um, 
you know, it, it has appealed. There's been a file, uh, the formal appeal in, in his case based on just what you're talking about, uh, this this change of venue, because you have people threatening uh, the jurors basically uh, every day because they weren't sequestered uh, during, during this uh, trial at all. Um, you also have a, a juror who just straight up asks the judge, I want to be removed, um, you know, from this case. And the judge says, well, I don't want to be here either. Uh, you know, but this is your, um, this is your, your civic duty. Uh, so we have, you know, many, many stories of, of jurors and what's going through their, their mind. And you have to think too, as a juror, right? So maybe it's okay to just go along. I'll put this, this cop in prison. Um, do I want to be, you know, at, at a minimum canceled, you know, at a maximum killed, uh, over this, you know, my husband talks about, you know, intestinal fortitude that, you know, mm. people don't seem to, to have that um, anymore. But but I can see that. I mean, look no further than even, you know, my own my own story. I have nothing to do with this at all. Uh, and they're protesting at my house and sending death threats, uh, you know, to, to me. And, you know, my I, my son was seven years old at the time, you know, et cetera. So, again, these are people who aren't even involved in the case at all. And just look at what, you know, happened to 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 their lives. So yeah. um, it was sort of easier to go along to get along, if you will. Well, what do you think the chances are that um, Trump's going to get a fair trial in a Manhattan courtroom? <laughs> well, probably very similar, Dan. I think mm. that's uh, that's the case. And, and I actually have a whole section of the book dedicated uh, to the trial, because, again, you have um, not what the media is telling you, what, what they're not. Um, you have 14 pages of jury instructions for this jury alone. Uh, that is unprecedented. That never, never happened uh, b- before. Uh, you have so much limited um, information, uh, evidence that that's allowed in court. You know, I talk about these uh, four body camera uh, cameras that are rolling. I think it's about 90 seconds that they allow um, with all that. Same with uh, George Floyd's previous arrest in 2019, just seconds worth of that video uh, that is allowed. Just anything to sort of minimize uh, this scope. You actually have Keith Ellison, who himself talks about this dream team, these Michael Jordans um, of, of, of his team that he brings on to prosecute this case. They take up two floors of the Hennepin County Courthouse. Never before um, has the Hennepin County Courthouse been basically turned over uh, to the prosecution. These are you know supposed to be the walls of justice, if you will. Um, but they're bragging about this as, um, you know, as the city, in my opinion, continues to burn uh, to this day. Yeah. Um, what, do, you, do you see any kind of way out of this stuff? I mean, because it seems like all the institutions involved are entirely captured. The FBI is captured uh, by this nonsense. Uh, the Democratic Party, certainly. I'm sure there are people who don't agree with this over there, but they're they're uh, pussies, right? They're not going to say anything, obviously. Um <laughs> And yeah. and then the media as well. The the it is it isn't just mainstream media. Obviously, it's social media as well. Most of them, except for I guess Twitter now, uh, but most of them have been complicit in election interference and certainly with shaping narratives around all this stuff to divide us. Do you see any real pathway out of this stuff, or are we just gonna hang out, do our best until it crumbles and rebuild? Because that's kind of where <laughs> I am. Yeah. Um- I'm kind of a naturally cynical person, just in my <laughs> in my profession as well. But I do like to give uh, people some sort of sort of hope. You know, I think that just reminding uh, just reminding ourselves that the truth is on our side does seem to help me uh, a bit. Um, and the reason I sort of put myself out there and you know pushing this forward is, you know, I got I got a kid, and I don't want this uh, country to look like this uh, when he becomes uh, an an adult. And I and that, that's sort of what keeps me going. And um, you know, sticking up to, to some of this stuff. But I think every day I, you know, try to profile a lot of these stories here on Alpha News. You have people that are stepping into this arena. They're getting involved, you know, with their school board or they're, you know, sending us tips on things that really wouldn't be, you know, that people are afraid, um, you know, to come forward to um, talk about. So I really, um, you know, I really am, you know, hopeful um, be, because so many more people are, are sort of, you know, kind of joining the, the movement, if you will. People, again, that have not been political in the past, um, you know, sadly, there, there's ties to, again, policing becomes political. You have medical care becoming political. And that that's troubling uh, to, to, to me as well. But but I think that, uh, you know, just just takes, um, you know, that intestinal fortitude, that that courage to come forward and just say, you know, enough is enough. Yeah, that's kind of the premise of this show. I call it citizen because my my idea is that you can you know bitch and moan about your rights uh you can be a victim you can feel offended by things and then you uh you know if that's your behavior you're going to sit around essentially and wait for somebody else to secure your rights for you and you're a subject right that's how 
that's how uh, 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 feudalism works, basically, right? Uh, in or you can take upon yourself to perform the responsibilities required of someone to be a citizen, right? You, uh, if you want rights, you better do the right thing. You better fight for them because nobody's going to do it for you. There's, there's no version of any of this stuff where, um, you know, it's a, it's a delicate machine. Um, I, I think Reagan said freedom is always one generation away from extinction, right? Or liberty. I maybe he said liberty, mm. but um, it we're we're kind of in a pickle here because. I think I don't know. I don't. I, again, I really don't think that there's some cabal of people in a dark room somewhere making plans about all this stuff. But it's the confluence of uh, victimhood and a lack of responsibility and nihilism and all these things that just, you know, once the institutions we believe in start to fail us, uh, this is kind of the inevitable outcome of it, right? And you can do one of two things. Again, you can sit around and wait for everything to crumble. And hopefully you survive it and can re be part of the rebuild or, or maybe you can do something to stop it. You know what I mean? And, uh, I, we're, we're kind of in that, we're kind of in that period right now. I don't think a lot of people talk about, uh, civil war and national divorce and all that stuff. And who knows anything can happen, I guess, but, um, we're, we're in a war of ideas right right now. We're not in a, we're not in a bullet bomb war. We're in a war of ideas right now. And typically speaking, uh, you know, in reality, good ideas are what beat bad ideas. But in today's world, it's more market saturation, right? It's about getting your message out and stuff like that. So sitting at home with the laissez-faire, uh, 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 you know, live and let live attitude, I don't think is an option for people anymore. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and why I take uh, assurance into some of these stories, we're, we're you know, profiling on, on alpha and the different uh, tips we i mean we honestly get probably 20 30 tips a, a day and these are people who would never would think to even uh, or the, you know they would you know they would go ahead and, and send something to a, a mainstream media source knowing that it'll completely be ignored uh, but but just to, to give a voice uh, to, to them and, and their thoughts and when we put these stories out there there's so many people you know they, that they resonate uh with so that's what we found uh, sort of uh, time and time again. But I think you're right, too. And we're also in a time, you know, a kind of a morally bankrupt uh, war, I, I feel like, uh, too. If you would have brought up some of this stuff even to me five years ago, I feel like, you know, 10 years ago, certainly. But like, you know, we're, we're now uh, OK with kids deciding if they're boys or girls or and you know, I'm not even approaching. I'm just like, who? This is crazy. Like, this is just crazy. But, you know, just another story we had. um we had a drag queen dance at the state capitol on Friday last week, and you had the media touting this story as this, this is exciting. Um, th this has never happened before um, at the capitol, first of its kind. You know, history is made. A drag queen dances, and there's all these kids there. Um, you know, there's very provocative uh, things happening, you know, and all these kids are in the audience. But the media is, is talking about it like it's the greatest moment in history, right? Um, and so Alpha News, we do some digging and we find that this drag queen uh, is offering sexual services on, on websites, posing with uh, blood uh, all down himself and all these satanic symbols and, and such. And so we run uh, that story and we have actually a reader um, and I, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly, Dan. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to drag, have this story drag on, but I think it does, uh, you know, kind of shine a light on what's going on. So we have a reader who basically sends in the Alpha News story to the mainstream media and says, why didn't you cover this? You know, we didn't know the, the truth about, you know, what, what's going on here. Um, and we have somebody from the mainstream media who replies and says, oh, my gosh, we didn't know about, um, you know, this drag queen dancing. Please let us know in the future. Um, this would have been so great to, to be a part of and to, to see for ourselves. I mean, that's I mean, that's the difference. Right. Oh, boy. So it's it's hard to it's hard to sort of um, equate those two in your brain when this mm. is what you're uh, what you're up against. Yeah, there was a story here, and uh, I think it was two years ago, the Austin Statesman, the local paper here, where there was a guy uh, who had shot up some stuff on 6th Street, and they refused to put the uh, physical description of the man in the paper, in the article, because he was black, right? And they people questioned him on it, like, hey, the police put out this information, and you scrubbed the part where he was black. Why would you do that? Just out of curiosity. Because he was an active shooter. He was, he was at large at the time. Um, and they were like, well, we don't want to perpetuate any stereotypes. Like, no, you're just reporting reality. Fuck face. It's, <laughs> I, I, I think you have to trust people to realize that 
because one dumb dumb does something, it doesn't mean that everybody who looks or thinks or or whatever like them is going to also do that. Because if that was the case, we would be in a lawless hellscape all the time. And frankly, even as bad as things are right now, they're not nearly as bad as most of the rest of the world. You know what I mean? It, 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 we, we just lost our ability to reason. It's a very uh, I think it's the same symptom of the the left's predilection to to treat us like children you know what i mean and not just uh the broader population but particularly minority people they're like th this concept that black people can't figure out how to get attorneys or start businesses or figure out how to get id to vote and stuff like that it's offensive it's right. it's, it's right. super fucked up i mean i don't understand how people aren't mad about that it seems very obvious what's going on there anyways uh, i know you got to get out of here uh tell everybody where they can find you where they can find uh the work you're doing now well, thanks, Dan. I, I've enjoyed the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just um, thelieexposed.com is uh, that'll get you to the the book, and there's an audio version as well. Um, and also, we have a documentary uh, coming. Maybe I can come back and, and talk about that uh, once we get that rolling this uh, this summer. But um, it'll be kind of officers sharing their insight from the the precincts and different things that were happening during the riots for the the first time, um, and more on more on the case. So thelieexposed.com and then alphanews.org. Uh, uh, is, is where I uh, put out some some content a um, few times a, a week, but we also have a great team of journalists here. So if you just want to follow along, uh, free newsletter, you just uh, enter in your email address and uh, we don't sell it or anything. You're not going to get spammed, um, but we just go ahead and send our top stories uh, every day to, to your inbox. Outstanding. Well, thank, thank you very much for coming today. It's been a very enlightening and interesting conversation. I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much, Dan. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen.